Uh, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, so, uh, good morning. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Bob Shrum, the director of the Institute of Politics here. On behalf of the Institute and the Political Science Department, I'm here to welcome you to a conference which I think has a special resonance on the 50th anniversary of the loss of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, Dr. King was a modern prophet, and his example and his words are timeless. He exemplified civil dialogue even in the face of anger and violence. He warned us returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. I hope that today we can shed some light on the uncivil war that too often stains our politics today. In fact, there's a headline on the front page of today's New York Times, courtesy of Mickey Canner, who pointed this out to me, Divisive Oratory Daily Has a Nation Spellbound. It's not about the United States, it's about Turkey. So this is a phenomenon that occurs not only in this country, but around the world. Uh, <clears throat> before we begin, let me acknowledge those whose generosity has made today possible. Leslie Berger is a member of the USC Dornsife Board of Counselors. She and her husband, Paul Williams, are not only forces for lifting the life of learning on the campus, but true friends of the Institute of Politics, and they're passionate about the question of civility. Uh, and let me thank Erica Berger as well. She's a Trojan who was instrumental in developing the idea for the conference. Leslie, Paul, and Erica, thank you. Uh, now let me, yeah. <laughs> now let me turn to the first panel. <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat, which will focus on the mixed history of civility in the American public square. It will be moderated by my colleague in the political science department, someone I like a great deal and who is part of the future of this university, Morris Levy. His expertise is in voter behavior, race, and ethnicity and politics, and I'll get out of the way so they can begin. <laughs> Civility, hell. <laughs> Democratic politics has always been messy business, a whole lot more kickboxing cage fight than tennis tournament. John Adams dubbed Alexander Hamilton a bastard brat of a Scottish, Scotch peddler, a reference to his out-of-wedlock birth. Adams got as good as he gave from Thomas Jefferson, who engaged the, uh, the journalist James Thomas Callender to write hit pieces about him. Callender described Adams as, quote, a hideous, hermaphroditical character which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. Press coverage of Andrew Jackson asserted that his mother was a common prostitute and his wife a bigamist. Horace Greeley called the Democratic presidential candidate Lewis Cass that pot-bellied, mutton-headed, cucumber-souled Cass. Yeah, I know, he lost me too. <laughs> 
The Detroit Free Press called Ulysses Grant a drunken trouser maker. The opponents of Grover Cleveland used to chant, Ma, Ma, where's my pa gone to the White House? Ha, 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 to taunt him about his illegitimate son. I understand that Stormy Daniels' lawyer, Michael Avenatti, is hot on the case. Three years removed from World War II, Harry Truman described Thomas Dewey as front man for fascists. And just imagine what they all could have done with a Twitter account. The history of democratic politics is littered with accusations of communism, fascism, deviance, stupidity, greed, graft, and treason. It is dotted with duels, canings, riots, wars, parliament fights, and all-out brawls. Few who enter the arena emerge unscathed. And yet, many of us have a sense that something nowadays is really different, that we have taken an unmistakable step toward less civil discourse, that cable news and social media channeled some of our ugliest impulses and amplified the kinds of insults that might once have been safely suppressed. Is our intuition correct? If so, what impact will this have on the condition of our democracy? Is there any silver lining in having some incivility mixed in to a free and dynamic society? We are fortunate to be joined this morning by an impressive panel that can help us answer these questions. Without further ado, let me introduce them to you. To my immediate right is Todd Purdom, national editor and political correspondent for Vanity Fair magazine and a former White House correspondent and Los Angeles bureau chief for the New York Times. To his right <coughs> is Peter Mancall, the Andrew W. Mellon professor for the humanities, professor of history and anthropology, Linda and Harlan Martin's director of the USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute and vice dean for the humanities and social sciences at USC Dor Dornsife. Uh, Professor Mancall is the author of five books, and his work has been featured uh, on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, Bloomberg, Business Week, and NPR's All Things Considered. To his right is Mickey Cantor, who served as campaign chair for the Clinton-Gore campaign in 1992. He's also a former U.S. Secretary of Commerce, and he's a partner at the international law firm Mayor Brown. And finally, last but not least, Craig Calhoun is the president of the Bergruen Institute in Los Angeles, a think tank which develops ideas to shape political and social institutions. Uh, Calhoun is a sociologist and centennial professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists to weigh in on an opening question. Over the course of their careers, or if they wish to comment over the course of American history, how have the standards of civility, the ways that we evaluate it, evolved in our political exchanges? Oh, are we going? <laughs> we can go in order if you'd like. Yeah. Well, more, more interesting question. When I got this uh, list of talking points yesterday, I thought about it, and it may seem a trivial thing, but when I went to work at the New York Times in 1982 as a copy boy right out of college, I was struck by the uh, really severe formality of the place. And I remember one day watching an elderly clerk on the Metropolitan Desk named Gilbert Haggerty type a memo. He said, Miss Carmody, she was a Metropolitan reporter, Mr. Malonis, the Metropolitan Editor, would like you to work the Thanksgiving holiday. Sincerely, Gilbert Haggerty. Deidre Carmody was Peter Malonis's wife. And, and the, the, he was asking, he was addressing her as Miss Carmody and asking her to work <laughs> on the holiday. And I, I have to say, I'm just old enough that I still find it strange when talking with a hotel or somebody like that and you're trying to make a reservation and people ask you for your name and then immediately address you by your first name as if they knew you well. Um, I often joke when people younger than I am call me Mr. Purdom that Mr. Purdom is in heaven and please call me Todd, but I like to make the invitation rather than having somebody just presume that they should call me by my first name. So I think that in the past 35 years, there's just no doubt that civility in politics and, uh, and the media has diminished, um, and uh, so has uh, delicacy. Uh, I just finished a book about Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II, and uh, in a review in the Wall Street Journal on Saturday, the reviewer said that Oscar Hammerstein was the sort of person who in his day would be called a gentleman and now would be called a prude. And, and I think in some ways um, we could all do with a little bit more decorousness, a little bit more prudishness. I was shocked uh, in, in the New York Times Magazine recently when there was a story on the sex lives of teenagers online that a crude term for oral sex appeared in the New York Times when, when the clinical term would have more than sufficed to explain what was going on. Um, colleagues of my age at the paper were, were also sort of shocked by it, uh, but we're in the minority, I think. We're, we're seen as um, retrograde holdouts for a kind of uh, civility that may be gone. I can remember cutting my teeth as a political reporter in New York covering Ed Koch, 
who was the you know, flamboyant mayor of New York for three terms and you know, widely seen as, in some ways, um, an extraordinarily vibrant but also you know, rather crass at times politician. I remember vividly once he told a visiting delegation of Soviet school children that their country was the pits. Uh, not the people, but the country is the pits. The government is the pits. And, um, and this caused great consternation in, in New York circles that he had been uh, undiplomatic and rude. And it, it seems incredibly mild by comparison with what we might hear today. So there are a lot of causes for this change. I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking about them later today. But I, I, I don't think it's – and even with Morris's preamble, which is totally appropriate about the – you know, Abraham Lincoln was called a guerrilla. Um, th there's ample – history of <laughs> incivility in American politics, and it is a contact sport. But I, I think we have lost something, and I don't know that we'll ever get it back. Thank you. Well, it's hard to follow such, elo such eloquence here, but I should start with a confession. Uh, I am not uh, – can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> I paid for this mic, but that's a different <laughs> one. Sorry, different reference. Um, <laughs> I am not the, uh, uh, the dean for the social sciences, just the humanities. So, Bob, if I'm here under false pretenses, I apologize. <laughs> anyway, but when Bob uh, uh, asked me to come here I th I, and I got the questions from Mars, I really thought about uh, this from my, my professional background. So I'm an early American historian by training, and I spent most of my career writing about the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. And so, though I am an absolute devotee and consumer of everything political going on now, uh, I do tend to put this into the context of three or four hundred years of history. And so when we ask questions about, you know, where are we now in terms of civility and incivility, I am reminded that I teach a course, you know, on the American Revolution that created one of the great documents of American political history, the United States Constitution, which excluded a huge number of people who were Americans who were native, who defined another large number of, group of people as three-fifths of a person. And if you look at American history, you'd move it away from those who have political authority at any given moment and look at broadly at the American population. There has been incivility, depending on how you define it, ever since Europeans and Native peoples met on this continent, you know, 500 or so years ago. So part of the question and part of the difficulty that historians have come to this, or maybe part of the benefit that historians have come to this, is how do we look at contemporary things in the light of this very long history? So clearly there's been a degradation of, of formal discourse uh, over the past X number of years, and I think we live with this daily uh, whatever, I don't even know what word to use for it anymore, you know, sort of assaults every day. But I am struck, Bob mentioned that today's the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, this morning's Chronicle of Higher Education put together seven long pieces on the relationship between universities and slavery in the United States, reminding us at all sorts of elite institutions that a lot of our foundations are built on unfree labor, on the worst possible treatment of one human being towards another human being. So as we think about how we talk to each other, part of the question should be, who is even involved in the conversation? So much as we can say there's been a degradation of discourse, I can say from the perspective of where I look from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, there's been a vast expansion of people in the political discussion. Uh, that has led to all sorts of uncomfortable moments. But in some ways, though, we might pull our hair out or what I have left of my hair, you know, at this moment, I do sort of celebrate the fact that there are more people involved in the discussion than there ever before, and there are a lot of political communities in America who have been sharing in it and offering opinions, which I think has made our discourse richer at the same time, at the highest levels, we may see it become poorer. Thank you. Um, it's interesting to hear those who really understand uh, history, both American history and other history, run through this because obviously in the 19th century where we had hundreds of newspapers, all of which were uh, partisan in one way or the other, not just partisan but narrow casting, told lies, told lies on purpose. We even went into a war because one newspaper decided that's what we should do in the Spanish-American War. So let, we shouldn't get too, uh, I think, overly uh, uh, hysterical about what's happening today. However, however, in our lifetime, and I'm, I've been doing politics, I, uh, 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 as I said, I'm, I'm an amateur Bob. I've never been paid for it, so uh, <laughs> it's 50 years now of a number of campaigns. Uh, 
I don't think we've ever seen anything like we're seeing today. I think we have to be honest about that. Uh, this is way beyond. And I think it follows a eight years of grace and dignity in the White House. You can argue with the politics and, and the policy, which I do, some of which I, I supported this uh, President Obama, but I didn't agree with everything he did. But there was grace and dignity, and now I think we're almost like through cold water in your face at about 3 in the morning that you're being faced with what we're seeing uh, in, today's, in today's rhetoric. The problem we have, and it's a good problem, technologically now we can talk to more people. I want to follow what you just said, Peter. More people know about politics. They have more access to information, sometimes good, sometimes bad, whether online or tweets or whatever it is, or, 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 or the, the cable channels or whatever, and it's constant. Marty and I were just talking about that. Uh, and it's constant, and what it does is it invades, it invades many of our, 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 um, our psyches, and we begin to just, we begin to be affected by it in a way that's not healthy. Uh, but this is not only happening in the U.S. We just, Bob just read the thing, there's Bob back there, about the, read that New York Times article today if you haven't read it on your front page about Erdogan in Turkey. It's happening all over the world. It's happening in the Philippines. It's happening in Venezuela. It's happening in, 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 in Egypt. You name it, it's happening. So we have not really come to grips with how language affects people and how it divides if you're not careful about how you say it. And it's, of course, for someone who is, who is attempting to be an autocrat, you want to divide because you want to rev up a certain part of the population to maintain your place in, in the political spectrum of whatever country. So we've got a problem. There's no doubt about it. I don't know how you unwind it because forget about politics. Just start watching television shows or cable shows, uh, regular scheduled programs. Written. The language used never would have been used, as Todd Purdom was talking about, five years ago on television. Today, anything goes. And so politics only follows, only follows what is happening in, 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 a real, in real life. And so I'm not sure we can, we can unscramble egg, but we at least begin to think about, is there at least some, some thing we can do about impulse, about, about uh, a reaction, about, frankly, falsehoods in order to try to bring our politics to a place where we really can deal with the issues that we face today, which are real, which are difficult, but require uh, a, a, a understanding of history, an understanding of issues, an understanding of language, and what we can do to, of course, lead the American public. Okay. My career, I guess, started pretty much here, but during the Vietnam War in the late 1960s. And it wasn't an era that was, should go down in history as renowned for the civility of political discourse, um, nor was it an extraordinary trough. The ability to get political discourse on issues that weren't getting attention from the civil rights movement on into the peace movement and other things has often entailed shouting, not just speaking calmly. It's often entailed disruptions of various kinds. Remember the yippies or whoever from this. The, there is a tendency to confuse civility with decorum. And I'm not sure we would want civil public discourse to equal only um, proper decorum, because breaches of decorum are sometimes what puts new issues on the agenda or what accompanies new groups of people entering into the public debates, as others have said here. So the 60s is one of many historic reminders that I don't think we should speak of a, an evolution or a progress. And I think some of our sense of um, outrage is poorly served by imagining that there should have been two or 300 years of continual progress. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be outraged, but that the compared to when question um, shouldn't be linked to some notion of an overall evolution like things always get better. And we could make lots of different um, historical references. Witch burning is a really poor example <laughs> of civil discourse. 
Um, there are reasons why Donald Trump thinks of Andrew Jackson and the boisterousness of that era as something, um, he thinks of Jackson as a kind of forebear and a hero and the kind of insurgency of Jacksonian democracy um, is exemplary not just of um, uh, confrontational speech, but of an era of politics that in some other ways um, has similarities to the present that we may come to. The, uh, we got a very brief allusion, I think, to the caning of Charles Sumner in the introductory remarks, which isn't always remembered as an important part of American political history. But this is the 1856 beating to death, ultimately, that is, Sumner eventually died, of the wounds inflicted by a congressman from South Carolina, Preston Scott Brooks, right, who hit him about the head with his cane, his walking stick. On the floor of the On Senate. the floor of the U.S. Senate that great chamber of civil political discourse. Right, so American history has lots of examples of lapses. The fact that there are examples of lapses doesn't mean they aren't lapses. We shouldn't want to return to these sorts of, of <coughs> moments, but we should recognize that they come up. Well, 1856 is a sort of signal year in the dissolution of common feeling between the states in the United States. And part of what's at stake in the caning of Charles Sumner is indicative for the present. It's a point at which differences of values produce the idea of personal insult. Sumner was one of the great abolitionist figures, and his articulation of a set of values was taken by a prominent Southerner to be a personal insult to him as a Southerner, um, thus justifying the violent response. And I think part of what we see part of what media helps us see in the current wave of media, is a tendency to take these public issues all personally. Um, and uh, the extent to which we are unable to distinguish between a public debate and personal evaluation, ideas of personal worth, is part of what drives some of the incivility in this. I mentioned media. We'll undoubtedly come back to it over and over again, but in terms of what's changed, what's going on, it's part of it. It's not all of it, or we wouldn't have these quotations of um, extravagant condemnations of political opponents in print. Um, maybe reading can be calming. The media has been scurrilous before, but we have media with new reach, amplification, instantaneity, and this, and with a much wider range of participation in producing the content in the media, in amplifying it, the ease of clicking, of forwarding, and all of this. There's a whole different story around that. But what I would point to with the media, aside from just it helps to make this thing that's going on, is that it does it with broad participation. And one of the features of several moments of breakdown of civility is that they come when a stabilization of more or less elite politics gives way to wider participation of people who won't play by the rules of that elite politics and elite politicians who choose not to play by the traditional rules in order to mobilize people outside the elite for their various causes. And this has happened over and over again, and over and over again, rather than evolution, may be the way to think about history here. It's not that American history is a constant morass of scurrilous, nasty politics. It's that periods, 30-year periods, as Mickey suggested, of relative civility, of improvement in civility, keep getting ruptured by various kinds of challenges to the underpinnings and the coalitions that made them possible. And behind this are the points at which that more decorous politics seems not to address the experiences that people are having, often of major social or political changes, of upheavals, of questions. And when normal decorous politics doesn't speak to the things that are moving a variety of people, it creates an opening for demagogues or others to start raising those issues in ways that break with the decorous norms. Thank you. I want to follow up on, um, on some of the points that all our panelists have raised, and I think they raise a very interesting question, which is sort of this choice of strategy. And some of Craig's last comments were getting at this. And incivility is a strategy when, when, um, when you know, a group of people feels excluded from whatever the elites are peddling. Um, 
when the norms of discourse somehow are inadequate for, um, for the upstarts to press their claims. On the other hand, I was thinking, you know, as you were mentioning this, we have many instances that we could draw on where major social change that was quite disruptive, a distinction that some of you drew, uh, took place without, I think, contravening what we would th think of as norms of civility, the suffragette movement, um, the civil rights movement of the 1950s. These were things where it was very hard to get people to listen and pay attention. There were, uh, there were movements that required breaking some rules and shouting, but not necessarily being uncivil. So the question I guess I have for our panelists is what they think about what, what drives certain types of political actors, certain types of people who want to mobilize others to resort to incivility in the sense of this kind of personalized politics of insult, character assassination, versus other strategies for disruption that still hew to basic norms of civility. And anyone can jump in on this who has thoughts about it. Why, why do some uh, movements become uncivil? Why are they mobilized through incivility and others remain quite dignified? Well, let me just take one shot and just add just one part yeah. of that. None of us are going to... Everybody tries to answer the whole question. I'll just take one part of it. Yep. We've had enormous change not only in the U.S., but around the world, in a number of things, movement of capital, movement of people, uh, technology, uh, all of which have created a sense of, of anxiety and frustration among people. Uh, let's take the United States, which all of us happen to know, most of us better than we know other, other societies. The fact is, if you look around today, I'm, I'm 78 years old, the population we look at for good reason and for good change doesn't look like the population when I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. It just doesn't. We've had enormous influx of people from all over the world into the United States. They've been enormously productive. And at the same time, technology around us, I'm still trying to learn how to work my iPhone. Uh, uh, you young folks know how to do all those things. I don't, but I'm learning. I'm getting there. The fact is, it changes your life. It changes the way you deal with things. So you look around you, the population is different, the technology is different, the capital that you work with, I'm chairman of the board of a company called Lexmark. Uh, we make uh, laser printers and, 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 uh, and the digital printers, and we're, gonna make, we're starting to make 3D printers. And our headquarters in Lexington, Kentucky, we're 52% owned by Chinese interests. Now, that's the way America is today. We can argue all we want about that, how the Chinese act in one way or how the Russians act in another way or the, the Europeans, we don't like the way they, they are, are used. The fact is we're joined at the hip with the rest of the world. So we're globalized. We're, we're technology uh, uh, cover, uh, uh, bound by technology every day and looking around us, the population is different. We are, so we're frustrated, we're angry, we're unstable. And if you don't understand, if you don't try to, if you don't understand that, you react. And someone, you're, you're fair game for anyone to divide you as a society. In periods of rapid change. Rapid sense. change. I, I think, Morris, I'd say um, your summary of the civil rights movement is, is certainly accurate in the sense that <clears throat> it was a movement that is, um, invoked the moral high ground and aspirational uh, notions of what the, we should live up to the founding creed of our society. But a few years ago when I wrote a book on the 1964 Civil Rights Act, I was really struck by the viciousness of some of the discourse. People would write letters to the president, to their representatives in perfect Palmer penmanship, and there was invective that would not surprise anybody in an internet flame war. I remember Charles Halleck, the Republican leader of the House of Representatives from Indiana, got a letter from a constituent saying, you used to be the fair-haired boy, now you're the hairy ape because he was supporting um, civil rights. And his own caucus members, somebody put a furled umbrella on his desk on the morning after he'd agreed to let the bill proceed, as if he were Neville Chamberlain at Munich um, appeasing his opponents. Um, someone wrote John F. Kennedy on the night he made the speech uh, proposing the bill in the summer of 1963, uh, invoking you know Dr. King, addressed it to uh, uh, Martin Luther King, the white question mark house, Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, used the N-word and, and attacked the president for doing this. So I think we do have to, again, as always, be careful to remember that there's always been a lot of incivility. There's always been a lot of invective. Um, and I think one of the things that's also happened 
it goes hand in hand with what Mickey was saying about technological disruption, there's been the diminution of all institutions of American life, all the faith in institutions that once uh, people forget, or, or I had forgotten until I did the research, just what a huge role the ecumenical uh, interfaith community had in the civil rights movement. And we think of the religious right, but this was really the religious center and the religious left in the 1960s that drove that bill. And a bunch of Midwestern Republicans, frankly, in the Senate who had no black constituents, who had no natural political reason to be for the bill, were persuaded because they had a lot of Methodists and Baptists and Catholics in, among their constituencies and those institutional churches and synagogues uh, fought t tooth and nail for the bill. Uh, and uh, in fact, Carl Munt, a conservative uh, senator from South Dakota, when he voted in favor of a procedural move in favor of civil rights, was heard to exclaim in the Senate colloquium, I hope that satisfies those two goddamn bishops who called me last night. <laughs> and um, so I think the, the diminution of the strength of institutions, the diminution of the credibility of institutions, including Congress and the government itself, uh, which we seem to be, you know, throwing out the window with both hands at a time. Um, and, then, and then finally, in the case of civil rights, the, the actors in Congress who had to deal with the question all had, by and large, served either in World War I or World War II together. They had a, a sense of common purpose uh, in institutions in American life. There were genuine cross-party friendships of a sort we simply don't see today. Uh, I know it's easy to romanticize this, but people did know each other's children and families and wives and they played That's baseball true. together and That's went true. to school together and they saw each other in the grocery store and it's a lot harder to be uncivil to somebody face to face than it is via the internet or... Can I jump in partly just to make sure Peter has to give the last word this time? But the, um, the, and endorse that point about institutions and expand on a little bit. I think we have seen a lot of hollowing out of institutions and one thing that noting that does is give us some clue as to why we experience this in the temporality we do. That is, I think a lot of that is since the 1970s um, that we've seen this, and uh, this crisis of institutions, and it's sort of built up to this particular problem. But let me just focus. It's the, not just the shifting role of religion in politics, it's the decline of the so-called main line um, in religion, um, a decline in participation in the mainstream churches, the decline of what's been called civil religion. Uh, the churches on the four corners of downtown in the traditional stereotyped small town of America. Well, the small towns have declined. The villages have declined. Those churches have declined. Um, attendance has declined, right? The, the middle is gone. Now, there are um, growths in some parts of the spectrum of religious engagement but they don't play the same role of building and, and supporting um, a center in that sense, where um, you may think those Methodists are weird, but you accept that they are there across the street from your Baptists or whatever. And, the, um, and I think that this big religion as an institution is not just a set of values um, or very local practices. It's also a way of connecting the local to larger scales. And one of the things the churches did, and it fits in with your example about the bishops, calling members of Congress, is that it helped to connect um, what was going on in a variety of local areas of, to national politics with the sense that there were stable institutions. Political parties the same. It's not just that we have extreme polarization, though we do, and that's a big problem. And we don't have Democrats and Republicans living next door and socializing to the same extent, perhaps, as in the past in Washington. It's that the parties don't work as well. The parties are really to a very large extent broken at many different scales, and they don't do the job of coalition building. They don't do the job of connecting from the local to the large scale as well as it sometimes, and they're broken internally. It's not just that they fight with each other, and we do have hyper-partisanship. It's that they don't work as well. So um, they don't enforce norms of civility, um, and they don't um, give people a sense of a common stake in certain sorts of outcomes. So I think a, a crisis of parties is a big issue in this. Um, I wanted to stick in the comment regarding the suffragettes point that mobilizing aggrieved men um, is a lot more likely to get uncivil behavior than mobilizing disenfranchised women. <laughs> um, and the gender issues are not trivial in the way in which uncivil politics works. They're 
big issues. Now, certainly Kerry Nations was um, you know, engaged in smashing saloons, which could be arguably not civil discourse. But, the, um, but I do think there is a, a set of, of gendered issues. And I do think that we are looking at incivility that is pretty distinctively gendered. Not that you can't find women who are doing some of this, but that a lot of men unhappy with their positions right now um, are responding in very male ways that are producing significant parts of the incivility that we see around us. Um, so. Forgive me if I'm misinterpreting, but what I'm hearing is that men are pigs and they don't like change. <laughs> Wow, do I jump in now on that? That's perfect. Thank you, Mark. That's perfect timing. Um, last night, I watched a, a little clip that uh, the Washington Post went live about an incident in Asheville, which I'm sure a number of you have seen. It was about an arrest of an African-American man uh, for jaywalking across the street. Uh, and it was appalling to watch, and this happened some months ago, and the people, the cops involved, one had been fired, one had been reassigned, or whatever. As I was thinking about to, to Craig and, and, and Jackson, who I despise, um, sorry, um, I was thinking, what if, there, what if Indian removal had been live streamed, right? I mean, what if we saw the United States government forcibly relocate thousands of people, eight to 9,000 of whom died on the way from Georgia, Alabama to Oklahoma and southern Kansas? Like, what if we saw that in real time? What would that have told us? Now, I'm not sure what the result of that would have been. But I think, you know, as, uh, yeah. you know Mickey yeah. started with technology. I think, and, and this is where historians are always annoying, and I apologize up front, <laughs> we are in the midst of something that we don't quite understand yet. We're in the midst of a technological <laughs> revolution. Uh, if you're a historian of the book, you know, we watched this 500 years ago when print technology came and changed the way a lot of people communicate, and it took a long time for people to understand that modes of discourse were going to change. We're in the midst of this. Now there's huge small d democratization of who can gain access to vast publics from their phones. Mick, you'll be next. You know, you'll be, the world will be listening to you from your phone. I'm learning from my grandchildren. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think this question of, you know, incivility and the question of the sort of technological revolution are really bound up together. And so since religion came up, I'll just make one brief comment on religion. Again, a historical thing. Uh, 1892, in a period in American history, which used to be referred to as, you know, the ends of the Indian Wars, a phrase that we don't tend to use anymore. Uh, the survivors of the 7th Cavalry uh, were in South Dakota uh, and observed a religious observation of the ghost dance. The ghost dance was a revival movement of, of Native Plains peoples engaging in indigenous culture where they would go into sweat lodges and they would have uh, visions. You know, some people might think of them as hallucinations and their visions of the vision of the ghost dance was uh, that somehow through make, reconnecting with the spiritual powers of the world, they would be in touch with the ancestors. The ancestors would come back. The animals would come back. White people would disappear and the world would be ordered again. It was a religious vision. There are a lot of religious visions across American history. But this one led to uh, such a fear of threat that this was going to so damage the civil order that the cavalry assaulted and attacked and shot many of these people, a couple of hundred of whom died. And it's hard to not look at that and say, here's a moment when a religious group practicing in a peaceful way uh, had, was doing something that was deemed sort of uncivil or un-American and therefore needed to be brought back into the fold. So I don't mean to keep turning this back to these historical incidents, but I do think that you know, we are wrestling uh, with these big questions you know, every day. You know, wait, what does everyone you know, know about me? What does Cambridge Analytica know about all of us? You know, these kinds of questions which are maddening on some level, but need, you know, historian would say, need to be put into some bigger context. Because I, I, do, I do think uh, that 20 or 30 years from now, people will look back on this, uh, and they will make sense of things that to us seem so crazy now. I mean, we look back now. This will seem like an odd thing to say. 
But in the early decades of the 19th century, when the Industrial Revolution was sweeping through the northeast of the United, what is now the United States, people thought it was a profound threat to the social order, that the way people, people normally live was being completely uprooted. And what are we going to do? Well, that led eventually through a lot of turmoil, violence, mm -hmm. a period of women in factories replaced by immigrant laborers in factories. It led to an economy, a modern economy, that people sort of accept as normal. Okay, we have an industrial component. <coughs> Hamilton would have been happy along with an agrarian opponent. Jefferson would have been, you know, pleased by that. These things seem of the moment so all-consuming. The political chattering classes need to describe and define them. It is important for our politics. Things are going on in our politics, which are crucial, but I'm not sure the clarity and understanding is going on in our politics. Thank you. Really illuminating. One, one of the things that, um, that I think has been not fully excluded, I guess, but gotten at only maybe tangentially in some of these comments is the way that people who engage in uncivil behavior and discourse, nowadays anyway, uh, often explain themselves, and that is with reference to political correctness, which is a, a word that used to be, or a, a phrase that used to be sort of confined to, uh, to the academy, more or less, um, and that uh, sort of made its way out into the public sphere and is now um, the subject of fairly regular presidential tweeting and, um, and, uh, and comes up a lot in the way that, especially on the, on, the, on the political right, I guess, people explain their own actions. They are being, they say, uncivil in their discourse because the, uh, the boundaries of acceptable discourse, they claim, have <coughs> narrowed unacceptably to a point that prevents us from speaking honestly, um, that make us feel stifled. Is there any merit to these claims that incivility is, is in some way uh, a reasonable or at least a bold response to, uh, to the contracting of the acceptable bounds of, uh, of dis discourse in the political sphere and elsewhere? I, I don't know if it's reasonable, but it's natural and somewhat predictable. Um, the great Tom Lehrer, the satirist of the 60s, once said that there used to be certain words you couldn't say in front of a girl. Now you can say any words you want, but you can't call her a girl. And, and um, <laughs> at some level, that captures the notion that you know, the, the goalposts are shifting. And I think some people, uh, the president chief among them, are being purposely transgressive because they feel that the dialogue has been stifled. Uh, people you know, can't say what they really think. And certainly, it stri strikes me that Donald Trump has made it safe for people all across the political spectrum to say things out loud that for the past 50 or so years they haven't felt able to say out loud. It doesn't mean they haven't been thinking them. But it, it does seem to me that um, his success is proof that he's giving voice to a real sentiment and a real swath of uh, uh, societal opinion that has felt uh, it doesn't have a, a seat at the table or a voice anymore. Um, and, and I think that's, again, it, I don't know if it's healthy or uh, it's certainly understandable, I guess I would say. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and follow what uh, Todd said, because of this, this frustration, anxiety, or anger among the population that they're not being listened to, uh, they begin to, people, people need enemies, they look for enemies, and when, when our leaders begin to attack our institutions, everything from the Justice Department to the post office, from the media to the courts, what happens is those parts of our society, let's talk about the accountability mechanism, the courts and the press, are undermined in a way that when they, when they uh, uh, come to their conclusions or write what they're going to write, I don't care if it's conservative or liberal, it's undermined uh, by leaders, leaders who, who articulate uh, uh, a, a position that these institutions are not to be trusted. So when people feel already they're not being listened to and that these institutions must not be on their side, it just it just supports and, 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 and makes more, more concrete their notion that, in fact, they should react to it in a way that creates the divisiveness we're seeing in our society today. And, and what's interesting, I'd love to hear my colleagues up here talk about what do we do? How do, you, how do, we, how do we support these institutions, whether it's religious institutions or the courts or the, or the press, or, or frankly, the Congress, which is what, about 9%, Bob, uh, 
credibility right now, the Congress of the United States, something like that. John McCain used to say that level of support meant paid staff and blood relatives. Were right, right, <laughs> exactly. So, so it, that's where we need to start to look at that and what, how, how those in public office or outside public office and, civic or in, and civil discourse deal with these institutions in terms of what their credibility is and isn't. So I just want to follow. I, mean, I think Nikki's points are inc incredibly on the mark. Uh, I'm going to s shift slightly to go back to your question, Morris. And that was that you started with political correctness and universities. And I think that there are institutions which are under siege all over the place. But I think, and, you know, and I will confess, maybe it was because I lived uh, and was an employee of a public university in the state of Kansas for 12 years before I came here. But I actually think that the attack on political correctness is just an easy way to attack higher education. Uh, and I think that if we live on the coasts, and I'm very happy to live in Los Angeles, we don't see that w among the hollowing out that's going on in the middle of the country or in various places is the complete assault on education from pre-kindergarten through universities, right? And, you know, it, you wouldn't have to be a great conspiratorial theorist to think that if you if you sow enough distrust and discord about what goes on in prop higher education, that it's a fairly easy step to say, let's cut their resources. Schools and universities are just centers for indoctrination of people to become liberals or leftists or whatever it is that universities are being accused of. Uh, and now, you know, you, I think now, even just this week, past couple weeks, we begin to see this shifting when an elementary school teachers across much of the middle of the country in Oklahoma and other places are basically saying, stop cutting education. Maybe we'll finally see people uh, sort of say, you know, it's enough. But I, I, you know, with all these attacks on political correctness, I just think are an easy way for some people to try to influence the administration to reduce fi resources that go into making, the better, making America and the world a better place through undermining what we can do uh, and becoming a less... I think this is a historic turn. People advocate for a less educated citizenry in the future, I suppose, of a more educated citizenry. So let me come in. I don't want to actually defend the other side of this. I agree with Peter that that's going on. But I think there are a couple of other things to be said. One is we have an image of the angry Trump supporters and of their rebellion against political correctness. And I think we should also recognize that there are pleasures in transgression and that part of what motivates us. So there is anger, and there are you know, lots of anger, but there's also the fun of getting together and doing that which is forbidden. And uh, um, that this is part of what's going on in some of these crowds and in some of this tweeting and some of, of that. Secondly, that the, the attack on higher education is real, the attack on education more generally, and attack on knowledge, I would say, underpinning that. And I think if you look at the failure to fill so many positions in the government in which, you know, when we don't fill positions in the State Department, we're saying we don't need people who know what's going on in the world. It's an attack on knowledge. That there are a variety of ways, you know, the census, the, uh, in which the place of knowledge is being eroded. And the idea that um, arguments can be settled or policies can be made on the basis of knowledge replaced by it's just politics and opinion. If it's just politics and opinion, then there's not much to appeal to outside of, of these kinds of uh, shouts and uh, uh, transgressive comments. Third in this, though, the um, I think that part of the attack on political correctness reflects the extent to which for a 30 or 40 year period, we produced a normative order about what you could say that was at odds with what was going on in the country. And so let's have highly egalitarian norms of speech. Bend over backwards for norms of speech that are egalitarian while we produce deeper inequality than we have seen in this country since the Gilded Age and probably even then. Um, and let's um, say that you can't ever say anything about race, but allow an American apartheid to grow in which the odds of kids going to get high school with kids of the other race go down during the period when you can't say anything about race. And the hypocrisy 
and the, that is embedded in the dec decorous speech, right, I think invites some of this transgression. Now, it's not a defense of the transgression. It's not that it's good to be racist or good to be sexist or so forth, but that we, we see it partly because it's harder to defend as a real reflection of the country. I think um, these new norms that we, we papered over some genuine deep problems that were even getting worse by um, the way in which we dealt with issues of um, um, identity norms of speech and other kinds of things. And that makes, you know, a challenge. Um, and we saw local communities getting eroded. There's, you know, the story of towns with opiate addictions and deindustrialization. All this. this is not something that started two years ago with Donald Trump or five or ten years ago at the Tea Party. You know, this is a 1980s story. This is an older story. The... Um, all of these things happening didn't get the attention they might have gotten from the so-called liberal elites, by which I mean us. Um, but what we mandated was a certain mode of discourse which wasn't helpful for seeing these things or calling attention to the people who are suffering transitions to these things. Does anyone else want to jump in and respond to any, any little comments? I can ask another question, but I wondered if anyone wanted to respond. All right, I'll ask another question. To broaden things a little bit, I wondered, you know, we often think of incivility as simply a bad thing, and even in the way that we've talked about, you know, incivility as uh, maybe a, a predictable response to social change, maybe a, what we might call an understandable or close to an understandable response to, um, to what people perceive as narrowing boundaries of acceptable discourse that uh, paper over real social problems although we might be skeptical about whether those complaints are genuine. <clears throat> Is there any, anything positive about a public sphere in which our politicians from time to time act in a childish or inappropriate way? <laughs> Is, there, Is there any value in that versus having a, a sort of, um, you know, a, a political sphere that citizens are exposed to where everyone seems to be following a script very closely. Is there, is there value in incivility <laughs> itself? Not, not just questioning the status quo, but incivility. Well, I can only speak, you know, we all speak from our own experience and therefore it's narrow by definition. Um, the, the, the civil rights movement, the anti-poverty movement, the anti-Vietnam war movement, what we've just seen with kids in, in the streets, there was a certain, I don't want to call it a civility or, or at least recognition that they're legitimate interests, but that you had to act and act in ways that were not the norm at the time. Uh, uh, there were, look, in the anti-Vietnam War movement, there were over a million people in the streets of Washington, D.C., railing at the government. They, they marched on the Pentagon. There were hundreds, if not thousands, Todd, I can't remember, of arrests. People put it D.C. Stadium, weren't they, at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's not, you know, that was uncivil. It was not the discourse that you might have had in a, in a university setting, in a class. But change was <laughs> coming. My bet is, and those of you who are historians can, can, can correct me if I'm wrong, when the Industrial Revolution came upon us, McNamara Brothers blew up the L.A. Times. We had... We had killings, we had, we had marches in the streets. People were similarly dislocated because their jobs and their livelihoods were changing. There were no more horse and buggies. There were cars. They were all black Fords, but there were cars in the streets. Uh, uh, jobs were changing. People were losing whatever their livelihood was. They were trying to make the transformation. We're right in the middle of that right now, and it's very hard to least for me, to try to analyze when you're in the middle of it what really is what, what really is true or untrue, what is what is to be done or not done. All I can say is I want to go back to one thing I said worries me terribly. But when you undermine institutions, which may be the foundation of your society, press, courts, government, uh, whatever, uh, uh, churches, universities, and all of those have been undermined, all. 
I think then you make it, you exacerbate the problem and add on one top of it. If you have leadership who don't even understand the facts or are willing to misstate the facts, if not lie, then it, makes, it exacerbates a problem that is a difficult one to start with. So let me try to answer your question directly. I think childish behavior is good for uh, one thing only, which is getting attention. Um, and uh, it's not problem-solving behavior. It's not um, planning for the future. It doesn't invite discourse. Um, but it's pretty good at getting attention. And so um, I'm not you know, in favor. In general, I think we suffer from the inability to have a more reasoned public discourse across lines of difference. That's just all, you know, it's all good to have it, it's all bad that we suffer from the inability. Um, but there's one reason behind the prominence of what you call childish behavior, but in any case of acting out in public of this, which is it is really effective for getting attention. Look at Donald Trump's ability to run a campaign without spending money on ads and in all the usual ways in which candidates would do it because he can get lots of attention and command the media to be his servants even when they don't like him because of the attention it gets. And, um, and so that's why it's going on. That doesn't justify it, but it, it gives us a pointer to what to think about there and um, what kind of attention would in some ways do something better for this. And that can have a role of, of agenda setting, of changing the public agenda, and I think it may. Um, if we manage to recover from this and remain a democracy, where I sadly think there's a little bit of a question, um, then we will have a somewhat different agenda for looking at things we need to do in the country. As Mickey said, it's hard to put your finger on all the elements of that agenda now, but um, the, the uh, uncivil behavior, if that's what we want to call it, um, does um, tell us that the agenda that was in place for those who were being civil wasn't adequate. I guess I would say there is a place for, you know, a Howard Beale, mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore kind of thing. And often in more recent American politics, those kinds of sentiments have been expressed, say, by presidents, but in private. One thinks of LBJ. But for example, JFK genuinely got mad. Uh, in the spring of 1963 at what was happening in Birmingham and what was happening, at the, the, the exploitation that the Soviet Union and the rest of the world were making of the shame of America, what was happening. And he was impelled to action by anger and by shame. But, and, and he said, you know, if I were a Negro, I'd be damn frustrated. I, I don't know what I would do. I don't know, I can't say that I wouldn't take to the streets. I can't say that I wouldn't do any of this. And so I think, um, it, if, if politicians or leaders are impelled to action by anger or uh, you know, atavistic uh, instincts or in some cases even immature or, you know, what, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, uh, uh, unreasoned but authentic uh, anger, um, it can have its uses. But it's interesting that in all his public comments, JFK was excru excruciatingly careful to couch this in, in high moral terms, in, in basically biblical terms in the, in the golden rule. Um, instead of uh, really reflecting the anger he felt. So I guess maybe anger is a good, if, it's, if, it's, if you put the letter in the drawer and you know, think about it on the pillow, but you, know, you, you, you don't just vent. And what we have now in so many spheres is just pure venting. I would just say briefly that I think uh, there is a place for childish behavior. It's among children. <laughs> um, and I think it is an insult to children to, that we, we label bloviating blowhards as acting in a childish way. You know, they're acting in selfish, arrogant, irresponsible ways. Whereas <coughs> children are going through a normal sort of course of development. I say that as the proud parent of two now grown children. So. I suppose I should have been a little bit... Um, more direct in my question. You know, one of the things that I wondered is whether there's value in the sense that in a democracy we want the public to have respect for institutions um, on some level, as Mickey has pointed out, but we also want them to have a healthy skepticism of institutions and to have in mind that, uh, that their leaders are people and, uh, and not necessarily to be trusted or to be thought of as more than people. Does instability have some uh, utility in, in reminding the citizens that their leaders are, in fact, just people? Is there value in not respecting the presidency as much as we once did, perhaps? Things like that? Or, 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 is, that, uh, or is that dangerous? I'm good. 
Go ahead. I was going to jump in very quickly yeah. and say that I think it depends sort of on where you are in, in whatever system you're in, because I think it's very hard for someone who is defined as three-fifths of a person to have proper respect for an institution that defines them in that way, right? And so, I mean, there are times, and we can look back and think, well, of course they were right, but to people who we revere and whose biographies on the bestseller list every week, you know, this was the, that was the system that they created that put people in this thing. So I think it really depends on what voice people have. And though I'm entirely in agreement, with people who have said we've seen this degradation of vital institutions, and I'm not justifying any of it, there are times when you look back and you think there are reasons that people stand up to what to many people seem legitimate institutions. I don't think we have to worry about Americans having a healthy skepticism of their government. <laughs> Americans have never never like government, they don't want to be bothered by it. Most Americans, unlike the people in this room, frankly, let's, let's be, don't spend all day, every day, watching CNN. Uh, it's not part of their lives, they're doing something else, they're going about their jobs, they're going about raising their families, uh, they're going to see the Dodgers play, they're, they're doing things that normal human beings do. And they don't like government, they want government to work but they want it to stay out of their lives, not to bother them. And the problem is when you have that kind of, if you want to call it skepticism, at least disconnection, when you have leadership that undermines that in, those institutions, in, most, in many cases as we see today, without facts, without history, without, without reason, in language that is unfortunate to say the least, the fact is that Americans are willing to buy into it fairly quickly because they start with that kind of uh, disconnection. So I, I, the problem is I think we need, we're going to go to Q&A, I see. The problem is I think that we, we, we need to think how do we deal with this in a way that doesn't in any way stifle speech for God's sakes. There's nothing more important than speech. What did Brandeis say? The way to, to deal with speech you don't like is more speech. Uh, and that's what we need in our society. How we operate that, how we how the leadership deals with that, uh, I don't know. But uh, I think we're going to have to face that challenge, not not tomorrow, but today, because I think the challenge yeah. is here. I agree. Can I stick in one last comment, which is we would perhaps want to qualify Justice Brandeis's, Brandeis's assertion by saying something like, "It's not clear that um, how we respond to tweeting." is more tweets. <laughs> and there's speech and there's speech and in reason discourse and other kinds of things. And and it matters because I think part of what makes the Trump phenomenon and the uncivil discourse work is that it's entertaining and distracting. Um, and in a way we focus all of <coughs> us a lot on Trump's ridiculous projection of his personality into politics and the crazy things he's doing. But Trump's incivility shouldn't command all of our attention. A lot of really terrible policy is being made by much more decorous politicians. And so in a certain way, Trump is running the smokescreen of distraction while other things are going on in politics um, and indeed the economy that should worry us in important ways. Um, so incivility can have that bad effect too. Thanks very much. On that note, uh, we'll take, uh, we will take your uh, very civil questions. <laughs> Stephen Hubbard, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. I just graduated uh, from the Sol Price School here, which is why I'm back here. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the history of the rise of authoritarianism when there are multiple trends of upheaval in a society, because I see that's sort of what the undercurrent And So like, where did uh, Donald Trump come from? And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Thank you. Explain Trump, panel. Oh, my, my view is that uh, he is a uh, uh, should be an expected result from change that came upon us so quickly and created such anxiety in our society. That's my view, right. and and that doesn't exp that doesn't uh, 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 make it right, correct, or helpful. But that's what's happening, and it's not just here. We all know that. Look, I'm talking to people who know know all this. 
uh, it's happening all over the world. Almost everywhere you go, in every, every uh, uh, society, uh, democratic or not, democratic or not, uh, there's this upheaval that's happening in this use of language and divisiveness and so on, because people are trying to figure out how they're going to deal with this change that's come upon them so quickly. Uh, it used to be, by the way, let me just add this because it's part of my experience. We all just throw out what's part of it. Trade was never a front page issue in the United States. It was everywhere in the world. Suddenly what's come upon us with, I think, unfortunate moves by this administration, which is leading to some real instability in the world economically, is trade. Uh, it, it has only been a front page issue in the last 35 or 40 years when we passed NAFTA, and that's it. Now it's come upon us again, and Americans don't understand it. Our leaders aren't talking about it in a way that would give them some understanding about it, and therefore they're reacting to it in a way that's probably not helpful. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? Well, it's simple to make it a schema and oversimplify. Populist authoritarianism reflects the desire for order in a disorderly situation where people feel that bad things are happening to them they can't control, and some leaders promise that they will be able to bring order and control to that. It's not the only way to be authoritarian. There are also people who sit on top of things like the Chinese Communist Party. Um, <coughs> but, the, um, but there is a, um, a demand for that in a large, complicated society where everybody knows they're enmeshed in all these huge, complicated systems that don't seem to work so well and that they, at a local level, can't control. In the back, in the blue shirt. So you bring up uh, institutions, and I think a lot of the frustration and anger comes from people who have been, uh, I'm, I'm not going to use the word right lightly, betrayed by these institutions. Because a while ago, with a high school diploma, you could get a job that was relatively, could pay your bills, you could get a house, you could start a family. Now, when I got my high school diploma and I wanted to find a minimum wage job, Hardly anything. Then I went to uh, community college. I, w I was in, and I'm working at a McDonald's. And then I go to university, and I'm working a job that I could have gotten without a high school diploma. Now that is a breach of social contract. That is a betrayal, and that is absolutely disgusting. So what are we going to do instead of having these uncivil conversations where we are all angry to open up a dialogue and talk about the things, and we can start to rationalize things instead of sensationalizing them? So all sounds good if it's accompanied by actually dealing with those things. And, and so it seems to me there are limits to what dialogue alone will do and, and civil discourse. But I agree. There has been a huge increase in inequality. There is the globalization and trade that Mickey's referred to. There is new technology. There are a variety of factors go into it. Um, there are people who benefit from that. There are people who are able to do okay. Well, at least they own houses in good areas of LA, and so they're getting equity in their houses, even though their wages are stagnating. There are, you know, so it's not like nobody <coughs> benefited. And many of those people sort of look like the people who are doing well in the established institutions. And so resentment is, is justified, not only predictable. And the, the need for dealing with these things includes the need for dialogue if we're going to deal with them in a democratic way, but it also includes the will to deal with them and not just say, you know, hey, Mark Zuckerberg, whatever you do, police yourself, make Facebook work, um, and ignore the concentration of power and wealth in the um, handful of companies that run Silicon Valley and so much of the computer system. And we can't ignore the disappearance of well-paid um, working class jobs, so called, that is jobs that you could get with a community college degree or something like that, that you could sustain a family, you could have a home. And, and if we find, you know, this is where I think part of what happened is we were having a civil discourse and not doing anything about this um, for the last 35 years. And so civil discourse by itself isn't the solution to failing to deal with intensified inequality and its human consequences. Yes. Go ahead. 
Hi, hi uh, Michael Feinstein. I'm a 2018 candidate for Secretary of State, and in a past life, I was the mayor and city council member in Santa Monica. And holding that role, I felt a responsibility to carry myself with a certain decorum. So my question about decorum is when Obama ran um, in 2008, he talked about restoring our place in the world with respect with other countries because of the argument that Bush had lost that. What do you see the prospects in the 2020 presidential race of presidential candidates running to try and reestablish the quorum of the office? And who might be that type of candidate and how will they do? That's an easy one. <laughs> well, of course, every um, – I mean, David Axelrod likes to say that every presidential cycle is, is in opposition to the one before it. So it's hard to remember now, but in 2000, George W. Bush ran on restoring decorum and dignity to the Oval Office. Or as my colleague at the New York Times, Frank Kleins, once said, the first thing he'll do is replace that sink. But, um, but I think that, you know, uh, you can't make the argument that Obama was not the polar opposite of Bush in terms of his instincts, his uh, approach, his – uh, his, the way he uh, uh, used public rhetoric. Uh, the, the, he was cerebral in the way that Bush was uh, instinctual. And certainly Trump is the polar opposite of Obama. So it might be a natural thing that, you know, in 2020 or 2024, there will be a person who is in some uh, p personal sense or in, in, in the, as a personality would be the opposite of Trump. What's less clear to me is, is I suspect we, we all need to be careful to realize the, the degree to which Trump and Trumpism is playing well in the country. And uh, we may be appalled by certain things the president's doing or everything the president's doing, but I think we have to be really aware that if he maintains 37, 38, whatever it is, percent support, uh, he might be able to prove the, the truth of his assertion that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and pay no price, and that might be just enough for him to win again. So I think that um, it's sort of dangerous to assume that, um, that he is uh, as vulnerable as he might seem in certain other ways, and, and I just think that... Um, but yes, has he left a wide opening for someone to appeal to, a, to the better angels and to restore a different kind of... I think M Mickey and I were talking earlier before the panel... I think that will be very, very hard for the next president to do because of the diminution of faith in institutions that's reflected widely in all polling uh, that we've seen in the last you know, 16 months or so. It's, it's quite dramatic. All American politics uh, are entrepreneurial. Uh, we don't, the parties make no difference anymore. They provide no standards or no. They only broadly stand for something, but it's so broad as to almost be undefinable. But but I agree. I think the reaction in 2020 is going to be for many, if not most, of the, if not all of the candidates uh, to react differently than, than this president has reacted to certain uh, uh, events. <laughs> you ask who would emerge. Let me just remind people of what's uh, – I'm old enough that 1976 Jimmy Carter – no one had ever heard of Jimmy Carter. He, he came out here to California. I'll tell you a story – and he met with something, a group called the Malibu Mafia, some of whom you'll, all of you <clears throat> will remember, raised huge amounts of money for the Democratic Party. Right, Marty? And, and Jimmy Carter came in his, in his pitch to, and I was sitting in the meeting, was, if you raise me money, I can beat George Wallace in the South. That was it. And, of course, to the Malibu Mafia, to stop George Wallace was the number one, number one uh, priority. Uh, well, Jimmy Carter took that and ran and, 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 of course, was elected president of the United States. Uh, where in the world did Bill Clinton come mm. for him? He was the governor of Arkansas, for God's sakes. Uh, if you'd put him in a poll in 1991, I know I was chairman of the campaign, we were at zero, not at one, we were at zero percent in a poll. Uh, uh, and this is in 1991 in November. By January, he was a leading candidate for president of the United States. Bring, until we had the what we call the Guinefer situation, and then he became the leading candidate again six months later. I, politics is, is is where did Barack Obama come from? I mean, come on, folks, someone will emerge. We'll all be shocked by who it is. Uh, Bob Shrum will be the only one who would have known, and he won't tell us. <laughs> so here make, we make are. Here we are trying to figure out what we ought to be trying to figure out is. What do we do in, in 2018? How is it going to react? Is it going to be like what's happened in New Jersey 
and Virginia and Pennsylvania, now in Wisconsin. Is that a movement going to, ha is that movement going to last? We're going to have a reaction to that. Uh, uh, or, or are we going to, but the question is not where we go philosophically, ideologically. Can we have a discourse that will not undermine but support our institutions to strengthen our society as we go through the change we're going through? And that's the question. And I don't care who the candidates are. I care about where they stand on something like that. So uh, let's applaud that because yeah. I think that's absolutely right. Let me add only one factor to it, which is for those who have different values from the current administration, one of the things we should value is local and state politics to a degree that the Democratic Party to, in many ways hasn't. And um, that offers a variety of fields for action that are important um, and uh, that have been cultivated by politicians, both civil and uncivil, um, uh, from other political persuasions. But it's important. Thanks. I, I apologize to those who had questions. We're, we're near the end of the panel, and so I just wanted to ask, we've, we've already gotten into this a bit in the last question, but, um, but the final question for our panelists, if they could you know, answer in brief or sum up, where do we go from here? Um, and, uh, and that could mean <clears throat> both, I guess, uh, what is going to happen and also maybe what we can do as citizens if we feel that, uh, that the state of our discourse is wanting to improve it. Now, some of the answers have touched on that, but, but I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists for, uh, for his final thoughts. Well, first of all, I think it might get worse before it gets better. I think it's probably likely to get worse before it gets better just because it's the nature of these things they have to spin themselves out. Um, in terms of what can be done about it, the, the one thing that's been persuasive to me and frankly some friends and colleagues have said they, they have tried to do in the last year is to be more connected with our own local communities, whether that's your synagogue or your church or your children's school or your neighborhood association or just friends and neighbors and like-minded people, or meeting people who are not like-minded, reaching out to people who don't share your views. And I know that sounds kind of uh, uh, Pollyanna-ish and namby-pamby-ish to, to do that, but I do think that um, the building blocks of, of this kind of civility uh, start in the most local possible way, and I think people look at the global situation and feel rather hopeless about it, but um, here in Los Angeles, uh, there's a tremendous opportunity, tremendous needs, whether it's the question of the homelessness or inequality of wealth or just this thing that's playing out now about whether we should build high-density housing near transit hubs or whether that's dangerous because of the prevalence of highway fumes and uh, you know, whether the density is tolerable in a city like Los Angeles. Uh, I think that's a very uh, vital, vibrant issue, certainly in California, too, where we've all benefited frankly, over the past 40 years from my neighbor Mary Nichols's stewardship of the air. Uh, and if, if perhaps one of the best things California politicians could do would be to keep the emission standards for California and let, let California's emission standards become for cars what Texas's textbook standards are for the educational public industry, the one that the car companies have to deal with because the market is so huge. So I think that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of opportunity around us to, to try to at least honor connections and connectivity and civility in our own lives. And if we, if we could do that, it, it wouldn't be a small thing at the end of the day. And for better or worse, it might make you feel better because, frankly, if you're like me, when you watch the news at night at the kind of macro level, you, you really do feel, uh, I do feel uh, pessimistic about the, the state of the country and um, even hopeless at times. So. Uh, I think the long arc of history, as the professors among us would r remind us, uh, is, is not reason for despair. Uh, although I was recently exchanging emails with Richard Norton Smith, the, the presidential and uh, political biographer, and he said people ask him if we've ever gone through a period like this. He said, yes, the Dark Ages, and it lasted a thousand years. So uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, 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 well, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> um, I would just say, as, you know, historians are terrible at saying where things are going to go. But I will just close with a very brief thing, which is to say that um, it would be great if we could turn down the noise, right? There's just so much noise, so much distraction, so many carnival barkers taking advantage of that. Of, we're so distracted. I went to a Quaker high school in Philadelphia. Twice a week, twice a week, we sat in meeting. We sat in silence in a perfectly plain room 
And the only people that would speak would be those who were sort of felt to move people, whatever of the moment and would stand up to speak. <coughs> I never stood up to speak. People know me now would think it's hard to believe. But I never... Right? But the clarity that comes from detaching from it, the kind of clarity that you get if you surf, you know, when you paddle out into the water and your phone is not with you and there's no one calling you and there's none of the nonsense that fills the airways. If we could somehow turn down the noise, maybe we could get to a more rational place and have discussions about real things that matter instead of the nonsense that seems to dominate things. But as I say, I'm a historian. We're not good at predicting what's going to happen. Uh, I was going to say exactly what, not as well, but what Todd was going to say. So, who was it, Todd, that said, "Think globally and act locally"? I, you uh, know, I don't know who originated but it was, that. It's, but it's, it's, a, it's a great, yeah. it's a great, exactly what you said. You're absolutely correct. Let me just add very quickly: education, the economy, equality, environment. Just take the E's and deal with them. Deal with them in your local community, or here in LA, or the state of California as the state is doing very well, by the way, right now. Uh, and, and you can make a difference. Uh, and from all of that, if we can get people to do that, and I think it's probably happening around the country to some degree now, uh, someone will emerge from this mess in 2020 who will provide strong, I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat, I really don't. Uh, I know this sounds strange to people who know me, but I really don't. I just want some stability and sanity and someone who's probably read a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a high standard. Yeah. The, so I, we have a lot of, of consensus, and I'd already said I also think local and state politics, and California is a particularly happy example for state politics at the moment. We're going to have a lot of issues before us, but we have been making policy. I think at a national level, there is much more question about whether either the frame or the program has emerged to be motivating. There's not yet a um, strong, clar much clarity about a generation of leaders moving into leadership. So there's likely to be a lot of struggle to get attention for various different campaigns. And that doesn't necessarily bode well for a more reflective or even quiet um, uh, time in this. It bodes for a lot of people trying to get media attention to try to build campaigns, to try to raise money, to run on a national scale. And, and strong action, belonging to local institutions, as Todd said, I think is absolutely crucial. It's also a vehicle for recognizing the importance you know, of conservatives. There are liberal Republicans, whom I believe are not extinct, many kinds of Democrats, different, there are a bunch of different political positions that are parts of reasoned dialogue, where people do read books, where there is an attempt to formulate policy that works, um, none of which happen to occupy the White House now. Um, and um, the potential for building those coalitions, it seems to me, is much stronger locally and state level in many cases than it is at the national level right now. So we might look to building upward in that regard uh, to try to have some success. Thanks so much to our panelists. Thanks to Bob. Thanks to everyone who set this up. And thanks to you uh, for being such a terrific audience. Uh, now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I have some angry tweeting to do. <laughs> <laughs>